computer. Yeah. All right. I want you guys to be able to access this too. Um, all right, let's see some more. Actually, we'll, we'll watch a little Serbian libero too, just to show how much better Eric is. <laughs> so there is Eric. That's creating space with his legs. Watch this. So kind of easy serve, but you know what? He's going to still create space and moving back. So knowing there's a blowback, he continues the movement. So the, there's a blowback, but because he moves back, he creates more space knowing that the space will be limited once the ball touches his arms. This is nice. And this is why the split step is so good. Watch this. So split step, boom. And he gets a quick jump on it. And then watch, he just does so good job just holding his platform when he can. And when you hold the platform, you pretty much confirm the angle, right? If you hold the angle, it's going to go where you, your angle tells it to go. Whether your angle is perfect or not, okay, we can talk about that. But if you hold the angle, the ball is just going to listen to the physics of it. It's like throwing a ball against the wall, right? If you throw against the ball against the wall, it's going to come back every time. Um, but when you blow up, your arms come here, here, your hips open up. You know, it's a guessing game. And for you guys, we want to teach a technique. We want to develop habits. We want to develop how we can be consistently great, not just good sometimes. Tough serve, moves a little bit. All right, so this is a good angle. So on the preparation too, you can see Matt and Ron are a little different. Uh, I like to talk about three different setups. Um, Kind of going back into this passing course, the first day we talk about the split set. The second day we talk about arms, right? So Matt and Ron have a setup that um, the Bulgarian libero I use as an example in the course with arms out in bed. And so this is good because we naturally create a lot of space. You see with Matt, there's already a lot of space, right? Because our arms are reaching out. They're bent. The, the only downfall is now we have to lock our arms and then connect it, right? Eric is a little different where his arms aren't so far from his body, but his arms are already locked out. And so all he has to do is just extend his arms a little bit. Or, like you see, creating space at the last second, moving his legs back or falling. This is a great pass. So there's a couple ways where we can create space last second. Uh, I'm just realizing, realizing Jake Lewis is in the game. I don't know how this happened. Uh, so you can see he opens up his knee a little bit to give him an extra space. Instead of it being here and hitting against it, he opens it back to create a little bit more space. And at the last second, he does what I call a sacrifice. And what I mean by sacrifice is you sacrifice everything. Your upper body, your lower body, your legs, your feet. You sacrifice everything to keep your arms from hitting your body. So watch this, falls back, keeps it there, perfect. So for liberos, I think this is a great way. You don't have to attack, right? So you can fall. Of course, we want to be as balanced as possible because maybe we're falling back, we're thinking the ball is coming to the left side and we're already falling back, maybe it hits the tape. Maybe it takes a weird flow at the last second. All right, now it's gonna to be tough to adjust at the last second. So if we can't, we wanna be as balanced as possible, but uh, for liberos and outsiders alike, if it's in the seam, we're going to have to push off one of our foot, get our arms out, and maybe fall back. So you see with Eric, falls in the seam, it's a little low, low balls, so we have to do this a lot too. And you know what, we'll fall back and let our angle do the rest. So we have to be really good seeing the ball, making sure we're tracking it all the way through. This is a tough one, huh? On the right side, it's a lot tougher because as Americans, usually we're taught left is right. We're also a little staggered. And so when it comes across our right side of our body, we're kind of facing this way. So everything's natural here, right? Everything's natural. When it comes across our body, now it gets a little weird. It's like, what am I doing? And it's hard to create space in front of our body, right? So we have to be quick either with our left shoulder going in front or being quick opening up our hips a little bit and creating that space through our hips. Because when we contact this ball, it needs to be out in front of us. If it gets behind, now we lose the angle. If it gets really behind, now we lose our hips. 
and we want to start with our hips facing the set or the server the whole way. But once our hips open up, then we get in a lot of trouble. I'll, I'll talk about this a little later with individual arms. So you can see it just gets it just gets past them. It's a tough ball, and you can see his hips rotate because the ball gets past them. His hips rotate. Now we have to find like a ridiculous angle last second to put this ball on target. So just, I don't know why, just doesn't get a good step. And for these balls, these are tough. You just have to sprawl, right? Defense, we sprawl forward, but we can sprawl and we just have to get under the ball because if we're high and we put our arms down, we're not going to have that angle, right? The angle is going to be low. So we just have to sprawl and get our whole body and almost like pancake the ball or body to go up because it's a great surf. And you're just trying to salvage the situation and put a ball high where Mikey can set. Really tough ball. So this is very uncharacteristic of Eric swinging his arms. But you can see the ball floated at the last thing. It took a really intense float. And so he has to do something to put the, the, the ball on the target. Because you can see his target is just like straight ahead right now. And... So there's a lot of different ways where we can contort the ball at the last second. I like to call this talent, where it's maybe it's with your wrist and with your elbows, with your shoulders, you're bringing the ball back some way. The ball is outside your body. Maybe you don't have any legs. The ball is high on you, and your initial angle isn't good enough. And whether it's because you didn't move well, you didn't track the ball well, whatever it is, but we want to avoid this as much as possible because it's very, very, very difficult to consistently replicate this talent play with our wrist, for our elbows, with our shoulders, rather than just putting a great angle because we can reciprocate this much more easier. There's a lot less moving parts. So you can see he tries to do something to put the ball back to the target and he does a pretty good job. But you won't see this a lot with Eric and this is why I think he's so good. There's a little better. He still does a little with his hips, but you can see he holds his platform and keeps that angle. And when you hold the platform, you keep your angle true. And this is a great way to get extra reps before or after practice. And just not judging, just being curious. You pass the ball, you hold it. Oh, okay, ball went that way, maybe. Maybe a little more here. Ball went that way. Okay, maybe I can be a little more quicker. Just being curious in the learning process. Because for me and a lot of players, we're very, um, we don't necessarily buy into the growth mindset, right? We're always about this. Now it's become very popular growth mindset, growth mindset, but everyone is focused on outcome, right? We want the ball to be perfect every time. We want to kill everything, but you know what? You know, you're going to have a, a next practice, a next game, maybe a next year, maybe the next 10 years. And so by buying into this growth mindset and being curious of why things are happening, uh, we're going to learn a lot quicker rather than just being uh, so black and white and focus on the duality. I killed the ball. I'm happy. I didn't kill the ball. I'm angry. Uh, if you didn't kill the ball, think about it. What, what happened? Okay. Maybe I could have done something different. Really high set and I just tried to swing hard and went lower the net. Like maybe I can be a little more creative. And also with this curiosity, we're not so hard on ourselves because we're always so hard on ourselves, right? It's easy to compliment a teammate, but it's really difficult, I think, overall for athletes to compliment themselves and be like, to have that self-compassion. Hey, it's all right, you know? So I think this is something big, having this curiosity. And so when passing, when we hold it, we can have this curiosity and learn a lot quicker. You don't need a coach. Just by holding, you become your own coach. So here's another great job by Eric. The ball gets high. You can see his platform's gonna hit his body, and what he does really well better than anyone in the world, is he releases his arms. So he contacts it, has that platform, and just releases it out. Whereas a lot of people, what happens is they try and hold it, but the arm hit the body on the blowback, and what happens is something has to give, and what gives is the hips. And so it's here, here. So I guarantee you, we'll see this with the Serbian libero, <laughs> because he's not so strong. But um, Eric does an amazing job keeping that initial angle no matter what. So really nice. You can see split step. You can see weights on his right foot pushing out. 
His knee doesn't open up. Let's see if he finishes his pass. Yeah. So a little different. You can see his feet move behind him, and he also kind of throws his arms to the side of his body. Because if he keeps in the middle, again, there's going to be that blowback. It's going to hit the body, and his hips are going to open up, and that's where the ball will go. Pretty much wherever your hips are facing, that's where the ball will go, unless your angle's really far outside your body. If your angle's outside of the body, you can do pretty much anything you want. But we have to get a good read on the ball, and there's not a lot of time from once the server contacts the ball to our contact. So Eric again does a nice job. So you can see the blowback, but he creates more space by moving back and throwing his arms up. This is something I still have a lot of work to do on, but uh, Eric does an amazing job at it. Um, nice job, Eric, talent. And I think, I don't know what's going on. How you get this talent, like how you learn how to touch the ball, is you just play. You just play as much as you can. People ask me, especially, what can I do? Like, what's this, like, drill? Like, what, what's the secret drill? Just, just play. Play beach volleyball. I think beach is the best thing you can do because you have to do every skill, and you also have to learn how to compete the right way because if you don't, no one will play with you, and you lose your partner. So nice job by E. Gets the ball outside of his body, which clearly it's not going to hit his body. And he gets it in front of him. And then he just kind of falls back. Does a nice job on a ball that's high. So there's a lot of ways, a, different, a lot of different ways to create space. I think the two best are sacrificing or opening up your hip and then leaving your legs Sorry, bad Wi-Fi. Uh, back to the shared screen. How do I share my screen? There we go. All right, let's watch um, a Serbian libero. He is all over the place. You can see he has like a really unique split step. I laughed so much watching this. So he already has a split step, and then a gimpy, weird split step. So it's just so many moving parts. So this ball, he does a nice job. I think it might have hit the tape. Uh, but this is like the sacrifice. So he has the angle, and then he just throws his body behind him. But I have a feeling we will see some shanks. So nice job. Create space, but the ball gets behind him, and so you see he has to use his elbows to put it back. Uh, we rely on this. We're just not going to be consistently a good passer. Uh, just with a weird split step, you see he's leaning to the right, but the ball's in his midline. There's no need to lean. He's off balance and falls, and he's just a mess. Uh, let's get him back on this side of the court. Again, he's just... Uh, there's just so much going on, so much extra movement. You see his platform, he, it breaks. His hips are facing this way rather than the server. And you can pass well by doing this, but consistently you're not going to pass great because there's just too many moving parts. Uh, we'll watch a couple more. So we might enter. Sorry, Matt, Matt actually warned me of this and <laughs> my internet is not working so well. <laughs> All right, back at it. So again, just so much going on. <laughs> what is he doing? <laughs> Don't do this. <laughs> but so his arms, get, you can see it gets tight to his body. He's leaning, he's on one foot. And there's just so many moving parts, unlike Eric, and then we'll watch with Taylor later. It's just so smooth. Again, so this is something I do more often than what Eric does. You can see the ball gets tight to him. He can't create space because the ball is in his midline. He's not falling back. And so 
you can see the arms are gonna hit his body, his hips are facing one way, and it's a shame. And so the biggest thing is just being able to be balanced and then being able to create space when our tracking isn't correct. Once again, you can see his arms are already tight to his body, there's gonna be the blowback, hits him, it's a shame. Uh, just consistently, it's gonna be really tough. Let me get to Taylor, watch a little Taylor. So Taylor, like Eric, it's just so, so simple. And you can see he just does it every time. He does a really good job just being really disciplined, balanced, and engaging the ball outside and in front of him. And when he does this, he has a lot of space to operate if he's not right. So simple, let's get a good step. And uh, this is something I talk about too uh, in the passing course. Uh, there's three days where I talk about just movement and I use Sergio as a guide. Um, Sergio used to be the uh, ex-Brazilian national team libero. Uh, but you can see how he's not just leaning, he drags his left foot. And then with that, he's able to gather and now get his approach outside. Instead of lunging inside, having to get back, push back, lunge back outside, he's just so calm and so balanced. He has that balance, now he's able to go outside. Easy. Calm. So this ball, you can see, he doesn't get a good read on it. It drops low, he has to lunge. And at the last second, the ball makes another move. And so when you have to lunge, now you're just putting yourself at risk to any last movements. And so if you can, it's gonna be a quick shuffle. And now once you're balanced again, you can adjust to the last second floats. But it's something I'm working on too a lot, uh, getting a quicker read on the ball. And uh, in the first day of movement, we talk about shuffle and gather. So you shuffle and then you gather and you get that balance and then you're able to make a move again. Really smooth by Tay. You can see he doesn't have the best angle. It's tougher area five, but the last second, it's just a little movement with the shoulders. It's nothing, the hips, just a little movement with the shoulders, right? And you providing that platform where the ball is gonna listen to the physics and go where it wants. But it's not something where our hips are opening, we're moving our elbows, our shoulders, or sorry, our wrists. It's just really simple. Last second, shoulders. All right. And I like this. Uh, I like initiating movement from the shoulders because there's going to be sometimes maybe on float serves or balls that are in front of you where the angle isn't strong enough to put the ball either to the target or have the right trajectory. And so when we do push, we're not pushing with our elbows, not pushing with our wrists. We're going to push with our shoulders and or our legs. Because again, we wanna be as simple as possible and have the least amount of moving parts. And if we do have something locked, we want it to be our platform. Because this will be, again, like our wall and where the ball is just gonna to listen to the wall. If you throw against the ball, against the wall, it's just gonna come back to you time and time and time again. So simplicity is key. Tough ball on Tay. So one thing um, that I speak about, I don't know if a lot of people speak about this, but uh, I find it really beneficial when I train, I train about individual arms. And so all of us, when we're taught how to play volleyball, what we do, we put our arms together and then we bump it, right? This gets a little tricky, balls outside of our body, because once we put our arms together and we move outside of our body, when we move our arms, our hips naturally follow. And watching the Serbian libero, you know, he's all over the place because his hips are all over the place. And so when we have individual arms, if we're able to do this, and it's really difficult, but we can train it, we have individual arms, instead of coming in and then to the right, 
if you do this yourself, you can feel your hips be pulled out. You just wait and your right arm goes up and your left arm follows, right? So we wait here and our hips are able to stay. And so I like to train this uh, before or after practice and I have someone spin me a ball or float a ball and I will physically say like out loud, wait, 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 wait with my arms. It's the same as like when your coach say call a tip. If you call for a tip, you're more likely to go, right? So you say it out loud, wait, 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 and then connect. Wait, 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 connect. Wait, 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 connect. Wait, 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 connect. Instead of just subconsciously connecting your arms and then having to reach out. So watch Taylor. So arms are connecting, but the ball isn't in his midline, right? So now he has to reach up and now look where his hips are. So he has to jump bump. He has to do something crazy ridiculous to try to put the ball on the line. And he almost does it, but he did it. <laughs> and so there's a lot of ways to get across this, but I think the best is to try and train your subconscious mind by consciously verbalizing it. Wait, 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 connect. Wait, 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 connect. Because we all do it. It's just seeing how more disciplined you can be. This is a good move by Tech. So same ball. You see he connects his arms on his left side of his body rather than midline and then reaching out. So I think this is the best you can ask for on a hard jump serve. You connect your arms on the left side of your body and then reach out a little bit. Or maybe on your right knee and then reach out a little bit. Because we're all, you can feel it when you pass. Your arms just gravitate towards the middle and then we reach out. Gravitate towards the middle and then reach out. But we lose time and we need that time to create space outside of our body to get the best angle. Because if we're always passing in here, our percentages of passing or putting the ball where we want to is going to be really low. And so to fix that, we need to get outside of our body. And to fix that, we need to track the ball well. And to track the ball well, we need as much time as possible. Good move by Tay. So you see he puts his arms together on his left side of his body. And now it's a simple move and he's able to keep his hips towards the server and behind the ball. And you can see it's a much better pass. So patient connects his arms on the left side of his body. There's a lot less time you have to move. And because of that, his hips aren't lost. Let's see, we'll watch just a little bit more. I'll find one more match. Watch a little bit more of Eric, because what he does is so great. Oh, actually I played this game. Let's watch me. Let's see what I did well, if I did anything well. And then um, also too, I want you guys, uh, you guys can write questions uh, during this and send it to me at any time. And then you can also ask it anonymously uh, in case you're maybe a little shy to share it. So let's see, start out, you can see my arms are a little more bent. So it happens a lot in area one subconsciously, you just do this split step into the court. It's, it's so hard to break. But if we know this, if we know we naturally hop into the court, I, I think we can be conscious and either start a little bit to the right if someone's serving to the line, or what I like to do is I just don't even really care that much. I just know more serves are going to go in the middle, and I like this because they're going to have a quicker jump on the ball. So you can see I do a good job waiting with my arms where my arms connect there. And you can see my hips just naturally get behind the ball. Arms are out and I'm able to sacrifice the angle. Let's see, kind of hopping in the core. I don't necessarily want to do that, but I get a good step. You can see with my right foot, I push off the ground. Get a big step actually. And you can see the space in between my knee and the body.
see, we got Vandra serving now. Brazil has a really big team. And if you can see, I'm passing with the outside who is 6'10". On the right of me, I'm passing with an opposite. And on the full left side, I'm passing with a middle blocker because we did not travel four outsides. So we played this game with a middle blocker as an outside. Amazing. Ooh, tough one. And with balls like this, with balls like this, what happened to my... Uh, with balls like this, you have to speak. I think the liberals need to be aggressive in speaking. Who goes in front and who goes behind? And you can do this every time. So there's no ambiguity. And the liberals just always go behind. So we are able to not have moments like this where it's like, oh, I thought you could go. Because you can see it's a little bit on his shoulder, but it curls away from him. And it's just the perfect serve. But as a libero, just go behind. It's left seam, so it's my seam. And there's nothing bad that can happen if I just go as hard as I can behind him. Because if he takes it, he picks it off, and I don't crash into it, right? I'm going to go behind him. But we get a clean ace, and yeah, that sucks. <laughs> So I like this serve because this guy has a float serve, but it also has a spin back to the line. So I had to be really balanced, right? So I get a good split step. And look, at I'm stepping towards the middle of the court. And again, this is why Eric's so good because he's just constantly balanced. You can see I'm naturally subconsciously leaning, but I'm able to push off of it and then just throw my arms as fast as I can outside in front of my body. And I get a decent pass. It could have been a little better pass if I was balanced. But just throwing that inside left shoulder as fast as I can. And I do a nice little dramatic dive. A couple more. So again, stepping kind of the subconscious step towards the server, which happens a lot. But you can see with my split step, I realize the ball's on my right side. I use the left foot to push back onto my right, and I'm able to meet the ball outside and in front of my body. Ben does a nice job going behind me. This is what I'm talking about, having someone to go in front and someone to go behind. So these balls in the seam are taken care of, and there's no ambiguity. And then you can see my arms are able to keep the platform because I just fall back. A couple more. It's a tough one. You get a jump serve far behind me. And then you can see it's tough. It's high above me. But because I had the ball stop, a little bit uh, outside uh, my body in front of it, I still was able to get a, a good angle on the ball. And so we don't want to be in this position. But at the same time, it doesn't really matter what your body or your legs are doing. If you have a good angle, the ball will just listen to it. So. Super dramatic, I had to do some spins, but the last second, you have a pretty good angle on the ball, the ball will go where you tell it to. Another serve, get the ball in front of me. See my knee opens up a little bit, and I fall behind just to let the arms go. I think it can be a little more balanced on this ball because you can see everything's falling back away and I really can't put any energy back into this ball. So balance, 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 balance. If you have to fall, okay, that's fine. And again, just there's not a lot of balance. The ball takes a little float and just fall back. So there's a lot we can learn in our preparation with our, our split step in being in a balanced and an athletic position. Um, there's a lot we can learn with how our arms are starting, how much space do we have, are our arms straight, um, making that as simple as we can. And then the big thing at the end of the day is just do we have space? Do we have space for our initial angle to stay the same? And then we can, uh, we can train that angle through working, before or after practice, having someone spin you balls, someone float you balls, 
working on independent arms and then working on holding as much as we can. Because when we hold, we really don't need feedback from a coach. If we have a coach, that's great. But a lot of times, you know, coach probably isn't going to be there. And if you can be taught, be coached as much as you can, you're going to grow quicker. So when you hold your platform, you have the ability to coach yourself. And I think that's really powerful. But like I said, just kind of being curious. Okay. 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 I'm facing that. Way. That's where the ball went. Okay. Maybe I should be a little quicker with my platform. And so there's a lot of power through holding the platform because you get that constant feedback. And if you're curious with yourself, you can grow rather than judging that was good, that was bad, because now you're not going to learn as quick. You just focus on the outcome rather than growing. So uh, I already have some questions. If you guys want to write some more questions, uh, I'll, I'll answer them. I'll stay as long as you play against. Uh, let's see. Is Brazil the ser toughest serving team you've played against? Uh, no, Russia. I think it's uh, Brazil is some amazing athletes, but I think some of Russia's athletes are made in the lab. <laughs> so I haven't seen any athletes that Russia has. Just how big they are, how high they jump, how strong they are. Um, da, da, da. Let's see, chat. Oh, shoot. All right, we didn't see, you guys didn't see my screen. Oh shoot, how long did we, how long did you guys not see? We can go back. All right, we'll go back. Just the last five minutes. Okay. Okay, perfect, it's not so bad. All right, uh, let me know what you guys have for questions. Uh, I thought I had a ton of questions, but it's just, <laughs> you're not sharing your screen. Uh, what is the best time for a split step? I think right when the, at least at my level, right when the guy contacts the ball. So we're thinking right when he contacts the ball, we need to think uh, a little before that because how we process is just like a little second late. So right before he contacts the ball, I think for you guys, you know, passing a, a jump float or a jump surf, uh, maybe it's right after they contact the ball because when you're doing the, the split step, it's more of a, a hop rather than a jump. So we don't want to be in the air so long, just a little bit off the ground. So once we land, we can press and then go. Ba, ba, ba. Dustin, how can perfect mechanics? Um, I think a lot of this is two ways. Is you're getting extra reps and you're holding the platform and you're just noticing. Like I said, notice what happened. My arms are behind me. The ball didn't go where I wanted to. Okay, maybe I should be able to get my arms in front of me. My hips aren't facing. I'm leaning. When I'm lunging, I don't pass that well. Maybe I'd be a little quicker with my shuffle. And then also, I think, learning. Uh, this is why uh, I created this, like, this seven-day course overseas in Poland. We got uh, – I was working on it a little bit before the quarantine, but with the quarantine, it's just like, all right, let's get all my thoughts down and share it. Because I think uh, maybe it's not the perfect thoughts, but playing over 10 years and just uh, really not necessarily being like a stud when I was younger or even in college, uh, I've had to learn uh, by watching a lot of video. And so these are just my thoughts of like uh, different ways to be a little stronger and a little simpler. But I think, uh, I think reading about this will help a lot. And then when you can, watch as many players as you can. Find your own style. As I talk about this in the, in the seven-day course, there's a lot of great liberos, but they don't have the same style. So it's interesting. There's not just one style to play the game, right? And so I think it's really empowering for you to find your own style, find a player that embodies that style, and continue to learn from it. And once you find the style too, you're going to like really push yourself in this growth mindset because – you're constantly learning rather than focusing on that was a good pass. I'm doing well. Well, that was a bad pass. I'm not very good. You're just constantly curious and you're always learning. And I think that's kind of where I got to today is because uh, when I first started, I was so bad. My, uh, the first team I played for, we got dead last in JOs. 
it was a 16s2 team. The next year, I was on another 16s2 team. And so I was just always playing catch up. And I was already like at such a low level that the only thing I could do was get better. And so when I lost, when I had bad games, when I didn't make teams, it really didn't bother me because it was like, well, I'm already so bad that like I can't get any worse. And I think that's where a lot of young players struggle with, especially players that are so good when they're younger because they're the best and they get that feedback. You're so good. You get a gold medal. You're great. You're such a good player. And so it's like this, uh, this outcome mindset, right? And then eventually – you know, you're going to take some losses. Other players are going to eventually mature. Bigger players are going to get coordinated. And now you're not winning. You're not taking gold medals. And you start thinking, huh, I'm not that good anymore. And so it was, it's really kind of interesting, uh, especially when I grew up watching a lot of players that dominate when they were young. And once they hit some setbacks and start struggling, they just, like, figure they're not good anymore. But if you have this curiosity of always getting a little bit better, then when you hit those setbacks, those failures, those losses, not making the junior national team, not making your varsity team, you're just like, all right, whatever. I'm just still learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. I'm learning. I, I just, need, just need some work. Just need some work. Rather than just like being caught up with uh, the outcomes. I made the team. I'm good. I didn't make the team. I suck. I won the beach tournament, I'm good. I didn't win the beach tournament, I suck. So having this curiosity, not only with getting extra reps, but with your growth overall, I think is really powerful. And I, I honestly believe that's the only way I'm still playing today because my parents gave me this growth mindset. And instead of saying they're, they're happy or you're a winner, they just always said they were proud of me. Win or lose, they were proud of me by how I competed. And so I just was able to like hurdle, hurdle these like boulders uh, in terms of like setbacks, uh, having to walk out at college, having a red shirt. As a professional, I didn't get a team my first year. As a professional, I had to go to Finland to start. After I killed it in Finland, I had to go back to Finland. Three years on the national team, we had a new coaching staff on the national team, and the coach told me that he didn't want me in the gym. So it's like setbacks after setbacks, but because I had this growth mindset, it's just like, all right, how can I pivot? Here's a problem, but like, how can I pivot and find a solution? And I think if you have this uh, philosophy with training and just overall with life, you're just going to constantly succeed because you're going to be constantly finding solutions and these solutions will be building such a huge foundation to your character. Um, let's see some more questions. Sorry, that was a rant. Um, if I don't have a coach to give me feedback, how can I make changes to habits that are hard to break? Yeah, you just, you, uh, so the most learning happens in subconscious, right? And enter the subconscious, we have to get into the theta mindset. mindset. And that's pretty freaking hard to do. This is like the imaginary mindset. Um, so what you do is just get a lot of extra reps. Hold, you know. Just really be mindful of the work you're doing. Um, something that has really helped me is journaling. When I wake up in the morning, uh, there will be a couple questions I ask myself. Uh, I like to start with three things I'm grateful for. So I'm already in this elevated emotional state where learning becomes easier. And then from there, what is my intention for the day? Usually this is volleyball. So maybe it'll be like, nothing's gonna hit the floor without me diving for a ball. I had a year in Finland where uh, every practice, if I didn't go for a ball, that was a line trip. So at the end of the practice, I had to do line trips. If I didn't go for four balls, and I do four line trips. And I hated running, right? And so this started like wiring in my mind. Like, I see the ball, I go. I see the ball, I go. The ball was like 40 feet away from me, and I'm like diving. My teammates are like, what are you doing, you know? But you're just like wiring your brain, you know? So there's things like this that you can do that I think are great. Uh, again, holding your platform. Uh, but I think for defense, this is great for liberals or other people. You see a ball, you go for it every time. If you don't go for it, there's, uh, there's some feedback. Like you have to do push-ups. You have to run lines. And so it becomes just more second nature. You see the ball, you go. Rather than I see the ball, mm, maybe it's this guy, it's maybe not. Maybe for a passer too, you, you never get aced in the scene. And so you're just always going, you're going. So you can do um, little tricks like this. Best way to improve your defense, go for every ball, get extra reps, uh, have someone hit balls at you, arms out. 
And I think the big thing is just go for every ball. Um, my dad was my first beach partner. He said the same thing, go for every ball. You'll never know if you don't go, right? And then once you start going for everything, now you start finding out how to be creative. Sometimes it's a flipper. Sometimes I have to do this with my arms. Sometimes I dig up my chest. Um, if you go to my Instagram, maybe like 10 posts down, I have like a, like a kind of like a mixtape of me digging just balls with my chest. And so you just find ways, you know? Every ball hit, you want to get your midline from it. Maybe that can be a challenge. And so there's different ways. And I think you do this by journaling. There's so much power in journaling and not a lot of athletes use this. Uh, it's becoming, uh, I think I'm starting to see it more, but it takes like two minutes in the morning and two minutes at night. And there's an intention and mindfulness and purpose that comes from it so big. And then at night too, you talk about three things that went well. You know, when Ferb first started coaching, I usually was not training with the team, but once I was training, I'd do some good things, but maybe I could ace, maybe I didn't make a dig, and I'd just be like, man, I suck, you know? Didn't matter what happened. Didn't matter if I made some good steps, if I was growing, I was just like, man, I suck. Once I started journaling, I had to do like uh, three things that went well, and it was so hard at first. I was like, okay, I gave like good energy today. Okay, I was a good communicator. You know, like I couldn't find like positives, but after a while I would find the positives and be like, you know what? Like, yeah, some things didn't go that well, but the things that I controlled, like communicating, getting effort and maybe some like physical skills went really well. And so it kept me going forward and it kept me from uh, verbally abusing myself, which I think a lot of athletes do too much. And especially if you do this during training or during training uh, or during games, it's not going to help you because if you're like, man, I suck, like how much confidence, how much clarity, how much focus are you taking towards the next ball, right? Probably not a lot because you're just thinking how much you suck. And this happens for younger players. This happens for me as well. This is the, probably the first year where I just felt like complete clarity and confidence. And a lot of work has to be done with journaling and meditation to, to catch these thoughts and to catch and realize that these thoughts really aren't productive for you as an individual and your team to get to the next ball, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of coaches are like, get to the next ball, get to the next ball. It's like, how do I do that? How do I get to the next ball? And so mindfulness is big and you can get a lot of this from journaling, from meditation. And uh, where I was going with this in journaling, one of the last things I do too is uh, I'm honest with myself. What was the biggest challenge of the day? Maybe flow serve receptions were awful. Okay, flow service was tough. And how am I going to reshape that challenge into tomorrow's intention or purpose so I can learn and grow from it, right? So what can I do differently tomorrow? Get in early, get some flow serve reps. So journaling is huge because we become co-creators of our environment, especially with volleyball. There's so much stuff that we don't have complete control on, a serve, a dig, just overall how well we're playing, but we can control our ability to set our goals our intentions, the way we perceive challenges. Cause it can be like, this sucks. This team is too good. I'm not good enough. Or the same situation. It's like, this is great. I'm learning so much about myself against this good team. This team is showing such a good level. I realize I have to work a lot harder to be able to compete where I want to be. So how we perceive um, life and our external events is really important too. Um, what was my recruiting process like? Uh, it's pretty funny. I sent a letter to Harvard and I, that was for the Princeton coach. And I sent a letter to Princeton that was for the Harvard coach. So, uh, <laughs> I didn't get into those schools. Um, uh, I got a, I got a letter and a call from UCI when Sprawl was coaching there. And I was kind of interested, but, uh, growing up in Long Beach, I did a lot of the Long Beach state camps and my senior year uh, after Long Beach state camp, Alan uh, talked to my dad and said he'd like me to walk on. And once I heard that, I was gone. So really only two teams were talking to me. When I was in college, I was, I was or high school, I was nothing. I, was, uh, I wasn't even on the Fab 50. But, uh, yeah, Long Beach took a chance on me. They wanted me to walk on. And growing up in Long Beach and watching all the Long Beach State games, you know, I was diehard black and gold. And so – I walked on and that was it. So there wasn't a lot, but what I can suggest and what I got pretty good feedback on is when you write a school, 
you know, be specific. Hey, hey say for example, Alan, I, hey coach Alan, like I, I love to come to your school. I'm a big fan of your team, how your how hard your team plays. And uh, I'd love to come to Long Beach. And uh, I know you guys have a great sports psychology major. And I think when you do this and make it a little more detailed, then you can get the conversation going with the coach. Uh, having a, a couple games, maybe two or three games, if you play against good teams, not necessarily your best game against a crappy team, but having a pretty good level against a great team. And then uh, I would teach yourself some iMovie. It's really easy. And then make a little highlight so the coach can see really what you're capable of. But uh, I think nowadays, like, it's, it's I won't say easy, but it's pretty easy to get into college because if you really believe in yourself, you can go to a city college, go to NIAA, city college, go two years, work really hard and keep in contact with a D1 coach and eventually transfer there. But if you really want to do it, it's for sure. Go walk on, wipe the floors. When I was at Long Beach, I wiped the floors for my first year. You, you can do it. You know, anything's possible. Uh, what are some key words you tell yourself as you prepare to pass the next ball? Um, I used to be very vocal with myself. I would have like keywords and stuff like that, but overall I think it's just too much clutter. So what I like to do is I'll put this on my shoe is I'll say AOB and that stands for awareness of breath. I got that from a book called the mindful athlete. Um, people that watch basketball, this was, uh, written by a man who worked with Phil Jackson and taught mindfulness to the Chicago bulls and LA Lakers. So it's a really interesting story about this guy because Phil Jackson is, if you know, he's like this goofy old like white guy and he had the foresight that like I'm a goofy old white guy and these like younger, mostly African-American guys will probably not listen to me about mindfulness. So he brought in this guy named George Mumford who used to play uh, NCAA Division I basketball as African-American. And he was able to teach mindfulness and meditation with the, the key in this was like helping players realize this is how you get into the zone, which they already knew. And so I like this awareness of the breath because when I'm thinking of all this stuff, right? Oh, I'm not passing well. Get your arms out. Move your legs. Now we're going to be a lot tighter, right? And this book called The Inner Game of Tennis, they talk about this, this self one or kind of the conscious mind do this, do that, you're not doing well, now you get tight. The self too, the subconscious mind, which again is like a million times faster, it already knows. You, you know how to pass the ball. If someone were to say, hey, turn around and throw a ball at you, you just pass it, right? There's no conscious thinking going on. Your subconscious already knows how to do this. And so I think it's important once you're in the game, you just let your body do what it already knows how to do. And after the game, if you don't like move your feet or lunge, okay, you can work about this in practice where you have time to let your conscious mind work on stuff. But for me, it's just coming back to the breath. Right? And now you're gonna have as much clarity, confidence, and focus as, po as much as possible. Maybe, yeah, maybe your skill isn't what it needs to be to make that pass, but when you come back to the breath time and time again, you're going to have more focus and confidence and you're going to be able to observe all maybe the, the negative malicious thoughts that are going inside your head. Like you're not good. You're going to get subbed out, whatever it is, you know, like coming back to the breath, you're able to focus your mind on the breath rather than letting the thoughts control you. And so I think that's a big thing for me, just coming back to the breath time and time again. So I really don't say anything to me. Maybe if there's a good flow server. I'll just be like, all right, got to be quick get a good first step or on a big jump server maybe the thought is like arms out fast but more than often it's just focusing on my breath because with the breath i can more so or less escape the limiting thoughts inside my head that's going to take away from my focus my confidence for what i have to do and get to the next ball um good questions uh, do you have any suggestions since the boys are somewhat isolated at home for training while not having a net and some other options to pass? What is important to keep going while on this break? Yeah, so I see a lot of videos of people making like memes of like funny volleyball things or toilet paper. And yeah, if you want to continue playing with the ball, like sure, I understand touching the ball. I probably won't touch the ball at all. And it's not a big deal because there's actually – so much research 
just for example, visualization. There's an interesting study of visualization where, you know, people were shooting free throws, people did nothing, and some people were just visualizing or shooting free throws. The people that visualizing shooting free throws almost did as good as people shooting free throws. So there's a lot of power of the mind, but not just that, but I think now's a great time to uh, establish and work on different things off the court that can turn into um, habits. So waking up and meditating, right? Because in the game, all you guys have felt this, and I know this because I felt this, in a game, you get tense. You worry the coach is going to take you out. You worry you're not playing good because the scout is watching. You're worrying because you're losing. You worry I'm going to pass these two balls. With meditation, you slowly become more conscious of these thoughts. And when you become conscious of the thoughts, you can just observe them and let them melt away rather than let them control you. So develop a meditation mindfulness practice, right? Develop an app. There's Headspace, there's Calm, there's 10% Happier. Do this because it will have short-term benefits and it will have long-term benefits. Um, also, I think learning about food. What are you really eating? Is this food serving you? Like, uh, I'm plant-based, I don't need to get into that. But like, for sure, soda's not serving you, right? Pizza's not serving you. Once in a while, yeah, why not? Snacking on chips, that's not helping you. So learning about food, learning about cooking. And the thing is, once you start cooking, food tastes a lot better. It's really weird. But once you start cooking, once you start eating more fresh food, whole plants, whole, sorry, plant-based whole foods, you start taking more pleasure. You start feeling better. Your mind is clear, you know? As, as kids, like, you guys should not be consuming caffeine at all. Like, soda, energy drinks. No, man, that's messing with you so much. Learning about food. Uh, watching video on players, finding your style. Uh, if you guys, again, I'll, I'll give further link. This, uh, my website, Noisy Buckets, I have a, it's free, seven day uh, passing course that comes in emails. Uh, I had to do it on the email version because I put 6,000 words into it. And on each topic, I put different styles because there's a lot of different styles. You can go Eric's way, you can go Genia, the, the Libero from France play like Sergio, whatever it is. But I think this is really interesting because you can come, become a co-creator on how you're learning how to play the game rather than just, I pass the ball good, I pass the ball well. It's like, how was my spacing? How was my split step? How am I doing uh, with regards to moving? Am I shuffling and gathering? Am I shuffling and uh, sliding my foot? Am I crossovering? And learning more about the sport technically. Because right now there's... There's a lot of opportunities to do and invest time in the things that you previously didn't have time to invest in. If you want to be better in volleyball later in the game, start reading some mindfulness books, some mindset books, sports psychology books. Uh, in my second year in Finland, I, I hit like a roadblock. I wasn't playing that well. I was like, man, my career is going to be over. What am I doing to further my career? Because I used to play a lot of video games, a lot of League of Legends, right? I like to play League of Legends. I like to party. But I realized, I was like, man, I love volleyball more than this stuff. And this stuff is like killing me. So cutting these bad habits, right? Cut those bad habits. I started reading a ton. Started reading about sports psychology. Uh, the next question talks about my plant-based diet. After that, I started reading about food. And I became curious about a plant-based diet. I was like, what is this? Can make me better? Maybe. I'll try it. You know? And so right now, I think it's, so, it's such a great opportunity to consume information uh, to start a med meditation practice, to start journaling, and to make these habits so when volleyball comes back into your life, you already have these habits dialed in. And that's the big thing. It's like practicing hard is great, but you know what? Most people in the world are practicing hard. Getting extra reps are great, but a lot of people are getting extra reps too. What about meditating? Are a lot of young athletes meditating, journaling? Are they visualizing? Are they conscious about their sleep? Are they eating clean? These are all edges that you can get. All edges you can get easily. Boom. Meditation, 10 minutes a day. Journaling, 2 minutes a day. And these are real habits and benefits that you can bring back to your game. Like, man, when I was in college, I was like 140 pounds. I was so skinny, so weak. Uh, I'm so slow. I lose the middles at line trips. But you know what? I just invest in all these things outside of the court to make me better. And it 
more or less has, you know? Uh, so I think there's a lot of power right now. Everyone's like, what can I do for volleyball, volleyball, volleyball? Start learning, be curious. How can I take things off the court, invest my time in it, knowing that it's gonna make me bigger, not just better, not just now, but going later into my career. And so I think a lot of people experience these moments where you doubt yourself, you know, or you're thinking about the coach pulling you out, things like this, things that take you away from being as focused and confident for the next ball. And there's a lot of things you can do off the court and almost only off the court that will help you in these situations. So uh, I can go deeper into this. I probably won't, but uh, uh, long story short, meditate, start journaling, do these things consistently because you have to do it consistently to see the benefits. Five minutes once you wake up, meditate. Five minutes journaling, morning and night. I have a journaling format that I sell. If you want it, I'll give you my format for free. I don't need your money, but uh, I want to help you. So I can give you the format for free. Learn about your food. Cook something. Learn how to cook. I'm going to have my parents' house right now for the quarantine. I'm going to learn how to cook some more. This is something that will give you short-term benefits and long-term. When you take control of what you're putting in your mouth, because this food is constantly building your body. You know, are you built off of Pringles or Coke? Or are you built off of like real foods that are coming from the ground? And then learning, start reading some books. Uh, when I was a kid, I didn't want to read because I felt I had to read all the time, right? I had to read science books, social studies books. I didn't care about this stuff, you know? But now you have an opportunity to do whatever you want. Learn about sports psychology, learn about mindfulness, learn about Buddhism. There's a lot of great stuff from like unique Eastern religions that can help you like calm your mind or just be more compassionate and loving, not only to other people, but to yourself. That's big and volleyball, right? Because you get down on yourself. but you can bring all these things outside of you, bring it back, put it inside of you, and then take it on the court, and you're going to be a much more confident, reassured, and focused player rather than an anxiety-ridden player that needs everything to work out to be confident. Because what happens in a game, if you start off the game getting ace twice, on that third serve, how are you going to feel? Are you going to feel confident, focused, or are you going to feel anxious? And so there's a lot of work that you can do outside of the court, bring it back once you start playing volleyball again. I think that's really important. Um, how long have I been on a plant-based diet and what made you do it? Uh, I saw a couple documentaries. I saw one documentary. I think it was uh, Forks Over Knives. And I initially tried to go vegetarian and I just replaced my, I would do like uh, pasta, pesto, broccoli, and meat at night. And I had no idea what I was doing. I just replaced the meat with broccoli and I just lost like a ton of pounds. I didn't understand like how like calories work. So I was like, all right, I'm done with that. And then I read this book uh, called Finding Ultra. I thought it was like a motivational book because at the time I was reading a lot of sports psychology books. And I read it on my trip to the next, uh, my next season in France. I read it the whole book on the plane because everything this guy did and resonated with me. And I was just like, all right, I'll try it. If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Because before then, if I went to Subway, I was like, double meat, Chipotle, double meat. I need meat to be strong. I need strong to be good at volleyball, et cetera, et cetera. You know, like most people think, right? Um, and then I read this book and just everything changed. I was like, huh, everything he says makes a lot of sense. It resonates with me. Never had these thoughts before. I didn't know any vegetarians. I didn't know any vegans. Try it out. So I just started getting more books. And at the time, there was just really books by triathletes or long distance runners. But uh, some of the books had meal ideas, and I just went for it. And then I read a book called The China Study that talked about the kind of the correlation between uh, having more, like more than 15% of your protein coming from animals and the correlation between like heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. And in my, my family, there's a big problem with uh, heart disease. And once I read this, I was already at a point where I didn't lose any gains in the weight room. I started feeling lighter with digestion, and I started really enjoying the challenge of learning about new foods and cooking. And I was like, wait, I feel lighter. I feel strong. I'm learning about food. I'm cooking. I feel great. And possibly, like, I can cut my chances of having a heart attack and dying early in life. I'm like, all right, all in. And since then, I still learn about food, and that's the best thing. 
uh, if you're co uh, consciously learning about what you're putting into your body, it's so empowering because it affects so much of your life, your energy, and your sleep. You see a lot of people mask this with coffee. Coffee necessarily isn't bad. I'm not going to harp on coffee, but having to drink coffee, I think, is really bad because now it's making up for uh, underlying uh, problems, whether it's with nutrition or your sleep. And so you just go down a rabbit hole learning about food, and it's great because the more you learn about food, what you put into your body, how your body reacts to certain food, uh, you're going to have a, a better foundation to have more energy and to do whatever you want to do in life with a, a clear mind and more natural energy. And I think that's really important. So use this time right now to start learning about food. Don't have to go plant-based, but I think eating most of your calories from plants is uh, very beneficial, especially to athletes. So start learning, start messing around, start making some oatmeal. Uh, if you guys want recipes, uh, I'm currently working kind of like on a, a cookbook, plant-based seven day challenge. So I'm happy to help you guys. I'm a big fan of smoothies because that's really easy on digestion. Um, couple more questions. Do you have any advice on how short outside can begin to get looked at by schools at higher level club teams as a libero? So, uh, of course, just being a great ball control outside is great. But, uh, Something I think a lot of players can learn from is watching Kubiak from Poland. Maybe you guys want, we can do like another film analysis of Kubiak. Kubiak is really short, but he's an amazing passer. He's an amazing defender. When he has to set the ball, he does an amazing job. Uh, great hitting choices, but I think the thing he does best is his mentality. And this is something that you can control. You can control how you step onto the court. And Kubiak does an amazing job. He goes a little bit too much at times, in my opinion, of like talking trash and stuff like that. But when he's on the court, he's just all in and he's a killer. And it's like the defense mentality. You see a ball, you just go. You know, he's going to take every ball. If he kills a ball and he sees like a hole and he goes hard, he puts everything he has to it and like is yelling. He gives a ton of fire to his team. And I think these things, these qualities are things that you don't have to be big to do. You don't have to be big to have like an amazing mindset on defense. You don't have to be big to be aggressive. You don't have to be big to give your team fire. You don't have to be big to give teams high fives or push your players around. And the thing is coaches notice that. Coaches want players like that. You look at Long Beach, they won a national championship a couple years ago with like a 6-1 outside from Norway. But this guy, uh, in knowing Long Beach, he was like the perfect guy, you know, super fired up, works really hard in the weight room. He's a big team guy, goes for everything. You know, he just brings that fire to the team. And coaches need that. Coaches need and want that. They want a guy that can give to the team. They want a guy that can pick up the team. They want a guy that can make guys around him better. And so you don't need to be tall or short. You can do this. It's all mindset. It's how you approach the game. You approach it with respect and with love and compassion for your teammates. So I think this is really important. Uh, how is Spraw as a coach asking for a friend who's being recruited by UCLA? Um, yeah, he's done a lot of great things for volleyball. Um, I don't know. If you want uh, if you want my advice, I say go to Long Beach State, hang out with Ferbs a little bit more, win a couple of championships there. No, Spraw's a, Spraw's a great coach. Um, cool. If you guys have any questions, last questions, uh, write me. And uh, if not, uh, you guys can hit me up on Instagram. I'm always happy to help you guys. Uh, let's see. I'm going to write a message on the chat. I'm going to give you the website. So what you do is you just register just give me your email. And within a day, you're going to get the, uh, the first email. It'll be day one. So we'll talk about split step. There's three different styles. There's a two legged, there's an approach and there's a one footed split step. And then you also have the ability to not split at all. Um, Mauricio from Brazil, he's a receiver, he does this, and he's a great passer. And you'll see this with regards to the whole themes. I want to show you all the ways you can play volleyball so you can find your own way. I don't want to put you in a box because when you find your own style, now when you're working, you're constantly creating and growing, and it's up to you. And I think being a co-creator in your own style, you'll grow a lot more. Uh, learn about the split step. You learn about um, 
how we start with our arms. There's three different ways. The other way we didn't talk about is like arms wide. Zhenia and Satorsky do this from Poland. And it's a little wild, but I like it because like I said, our arms come together and then go out. But with these guys, it takes so long to come together that now they can go out instead of naturally coming together and then everything opens up. We don't want to open up our hips, right? So we can do this. There's three different ways. I talk about the power of individual arms, the fourth day, how you can train that. We kind of spoke about that. Five, six, seven, I use Sergio as a guide to how we can move, move quicker because like I said, there's not a lot of time in between contact of the server and the contact of the passer, but there's ways where we can steal time. And learning proper footwork moving, there's a crossover, a shuffle and gather, and a step and slide. These are three ways to be quick and to be balanced. And then the last day, talk about space. So we can create space by opening up our hips, opening up our hips and rising, or lifting our leg by sacrificing and falling away. Uh, we can create space in between our legs. This is pretty difficult to do, but if the ball comes right into you in low, we can create space in between our legs and we can create space between, uh, by moving our feet backwards. So on contact, we keep on moving our feet. I know this is taught a lot in the women's game. Something I was never taught, and by making this video, I kind of realized that like, I should be doing this more. What am I doing? So uh, I hope you guys like that. It's free. It's for you guys. If you don't want to do it, that's up to you too. But I think there's a lot of value that can come from that. Um, cool, man. Uh, thank you, guys. If you guys like this, uh, talk to Ferbs, and maybe we can do another one. If we do another one, we can watch Kubiak, and I can show you what I mean by the – the style and passion he plays with, which is completely up to you. You don't need to be tall. You don't need to be strong. It's just here, right? There's a lot of power that comes from here. And uh, the last thing I want to leave you with is, uh, man, if you believe in yourself, it's possible. It's completely possible. Like I said, I started when I was a freshman. My first team got dead last in JOs, right? I don't know how it is. There's, when I played, there was open and club. I was in club and got dead last. My second team I played for was another B team. And uh, I wasn't even a starter until my senior year in high school. So there's no excuses, you know. It's just, it just depends, like, how, how deep you want to go in. Do you want to wake up every day and go to the beach and play? When I was younger, I'd come home, i just set the ball against my wall time and time again. Set, set, set. I taught my brother how to play Pepper, who was four years younger than me. I just was always playing, always touching, always learning. And then even when I was in college, I was a red shirt. When I was pro, I went a full year without even being on a team. And so just having this growth mindset and knowing that with each day you can be a little bit better. And whether it's a big step or a small step, you're taking a step and getting better. And then, again, sacrificing, you know, maybe not eating junk food, maybe not drinking soda. It tastes great, right? But is it, is it really serving yourself? Is it serving your highest self? Is it helping you deal with inflammation? Um, and then, you know, do you want to invest in meditation? Meditation's hard, man. It's, it's hard to close your eyes and sit. Uh, but if you do this, you know, you're going you're gonna to have a lot of effects. You're going to create this space, this space in between stimulus. Say stimulus is like getting aced, you know? Initially, you're probably going to have this reaction, maybe like curse out loud or to yourself silently. But when you create this space, you're like, you know what? I don't need to curse. I got aced. Get to my next ball. Slap my teammate's hand. Focus on my breath. Get to the next ball. I used to curse a lot when I was younger. You know, I used to party a lot too. But once you start meditating, you realize these things don't serve my highest growth. Or they don't align with a version of myself I want to, I want to be. You know? For, for a while, I wanted to be like the, the best partier and the best volleyball player. And I just realized that I couldn't do both. And so my, uh, the space that I created helped me realize what steps I was taking. Does this help me take a step to be the best level player I can be? Or is this a step going down so it's easier to make uh, decisions with regards to um, who you believe you can be? So I'll cut it there. Uh, I'm kind of going on a rant. But uh, if you guys have any other questions, uh, you can write me on Instagram. I'm happy to help you guys on the journey. Like I said, you know, when I was younger, I was passionate and I wasn't very good. For whatever reason, I was able to make it. So I hope I can help more people that are passionate 
uh, to achieve their dreams and goals, whatever that may be. So thank you guys. Maybe we'll do another one. Uh, but if not, um, stay safe and uh, use this opportunity to find the abundance in your life. So thank you guys. Uh, talk to you later.